Do graphs and charts make your head spin? In this video, I'll explain how they work and how we interpret them in simple and straightforward terms. Let's go. Give me six minutes and I'll teach you something new. Now, let's get to work. Hi, Mark here from Six Minute Statistics. And in the next six minutes, I wanna explain how simple graphs and charts work in statistics. Let's start with a basic question. Why do we need graphs and charts? What is the point? Well, the point is to visualize data. If we just looked at the data itself, sometimes referred to as the raw data, it wouldn't give us much information and would probably confuse the heck out of us. Graphs can be used to show a picture of what the data is trying to say and give us some understanding of what we're looking at. The type of graph we use depends on the type of data we are working with. In an earlier video, I explained the two different types of data, qualitative variables or categorical data and quantitative variables, numerical data. Let's begin with the qualitative data. There are two main methods of describing categorical data. One is a pie chart and the other a bar graph. A pie chart simply shows the various levels of the qualitative variable and allocates a proportional amount of space in the pie based on how often the levels are observed. For instance, the levels that occur more often are shown as bigger slices in the pie, whereas those that are shown less often have smaller slices. These slices are usually accompanied by either the number of times a level has occurred or the percentage of times. As the number of occurrences change in our data, the pie chart adjusts the corresponding slice of the pie. Pie charts come in a variety of styles, but all convey basically the same information. I am just showing you a few of the many options available. Bar graphs are the other common graph for qualitative data. Instead of slices, they use bars to represent how frequently or infrequently the different levels of the qualitative variable are observed. As with pie charts, bar graphs come in a variety of styles with lots of different options available. The look and feel of your bar graph is limited only by your imagination and your skill set using the software that you're working with. Lots of YouTube videos exist if you need help creating these different types of graphs. Both pie charts and bar graphs give a visual representative of the qualitative data we've collected. Compare the graphs we looked at to the raw data we saw earlier, and I think you'll agree that the graphs give us a much better idea of what the data look like. For quantitative data, we still use bar graphs, although some people call them histogram. Due to the nature of the numerical data, we group similar observations together into groups or classes, and then we draw bars for the different groups of data. Sometimes we get to choose these groups ourselves, and sometimes the software chooses for us. If the software chooses the groups, we usually have some options where we can override the decisions made by the software and ultimately make the decisions ourselves. As with qualitative data, the larger the number or percentage of data in a particular group, the longer the bar will be. While the bar graph shows how the data is grouped on the graph and we get a sense of the shape of the data, we do lose the individual values of the data. Because they're grouped together, we're never going to be able to focus on a single value from our data set in the bar graph. If we're interested in a specific value, we can create what's called a stem and leaf display. It's a clever name in that the data values themselves are broken into stems and leaves. As an example, I've sampled 248 student GPAs and created a stem and leaf display using a couple of different software packages. You can see that a GPA value of 2.5 is shown as having a stem of two and a leaf of five in one of the plots and a stem of 25 and a leaf of zero in the other plot. The GPA of 4.0 has a stem of four and a leaf of zero in one of the plots or a stem of 40 and a leaf of zero in the other. You'll notice that there are eight zeros represented in each plot, indicating that there were eight different students who reported a GPA of 4.0. A lot of stem and leaf displays also include a counting column as part of the plot. Some give the number of data values that occur in a particular stem, while other give what's called a cumulative count, meaning the count from that stem and all the other stems towards the edge or tail of the data set. The stem and leaf display can also show the shape of the data simply by rotating the graph 90 degrees. You're gonna rotate the graph to put the smaller numbers on the left-hand side 
and the larger numbers on the right-hand side. We compare the shape of the stem and leaf display with the shape of the histogram we found earlier, and you're going to see they provide similar information. Again, these plots add valuable information to the raw data we looked at earlier. Two other quantitative plots worth mentioning now are the box plot, or box and whisker plot, and the scatter plot. We'll look at both of these plots in later videos, but for now, let me just mention that the box plot helps us to locate extreme, meaning either extremely large or extremely small data values in the data set. Later on, we're going to call these values outliers. As an example, I asked the 248 students how many hours they exercise per week. We can see that the box plot reveals that many of the responses were considered extreme. Again, we're going to take a closer look at the outliers and how we detect them later, but it's worth mentioning the box plot here. Lastly, a scatter plot allows us to plot two variables at the same time on a graph. Scatter plots can be used to look for relationships between two variables. In the example shown, a student's height is shown on the y-axis of the plot, and their father's height, or dad's height, is shown on the x-axis. While we don't see a perfect relationship between the height of a student and the height of their father, it sure looks like the trend is for students with taller fathers to have taller heights themselves. Again, we're going to look at this plot in more detail later. Well, that wraps up my introduction into statistical graphs. Hopefully you have a better understanding of the different graphs available and how to read them. The next step is for you to try creating and or interpreting plots on your own. You've heard me say it before, it's time to get to work.